Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. In this lecture six of week seven, we're now going to be talking a little bit about the spectra you might encounter with optical and infrared um, spectrophotometers. What can we learn about an analyte by looking at these spectra? So ultraviolet absorbance is probably a technique that is really powerful for quantitative analysis, but less so for qualitative. Still, you can learn a little bit about a molecule by knowing where it's absorbing in the ultraviolet invisible part of the spectrum. So in this table here, what you see is kind of a list from Agilent of a couple of, of really common compounds and where they might typically have their lambda max value. So you'll notice something like acetone has a maximum at 271 nanometers, but something like acetylene, a triple bond, at 173. So clearly, you can kind of have a range of maximum ultraviolet absorbances depending on the organic functionalities that are present in a molecule. What I will point out is that the only molecular functional groups that are likely to give rise to a strong absorption between 200 and 800 nanometers are pretty much going to be pi to pi star transitions or heteroatom functionalities. These are called chromophores. They're pieces of molecules because that piece contributes to the electronic structure that you're detecting with the optical spectroscopy. So I don't have a lot of time to get into molecular orbital theory. So if this is way over your head or you've never seen this notation, don't worry too much. You don't really need to know it. But for those of you who have seen it, what you need to keep in mind is that in UV-Vis absorption spectroscopy, only the pi to pi star and n to pi star, the non-bonding orbitals to pi star, are really going to have low enough energies to contribute in this range for most organic molecules. So really when you ask yourself a question, will an organic molecule absorb at the energies that you're interested in, you have to ask yourself, does it have pi character? Um, because that's really going to be one of the most important questions in determining whether ultraviolet visible spectroscopy would see any absorption. So a lot of these other transitions, sigma to sigma star, for example, might occur, but their frequencies would be far larger, so they would be more to the ultraviolet beyond the reach of a conventional uv vis spectrometer. So keep in mind that that's really your focus, it's going to be n to pi star and pi to pi star transitions for most smaller organic molecules that don't contain metals. So here's a typical spectrum you might see, and I just want to point out that the pi to pi star transitions are usually going to have the larger molar absorptivities. Absorptivity kind of scales with the electron density in the orbitals and how much that's changing. So pi to pi star will have a higher epsilon or molar absorptivity than, for example, an n to pi star. This is kind of a cool example because I think it illustrates another point. If you do have pi to pi star transitions, either in a double bond or in an aromatic system, what you can see in these two examples is as you add components to the system, for example, in this aromatic case, as you delocalize the pi orbitals over a larger and larger area, you get a red shift in your absorption peaks. Your actual samples start to take on a color that's detectable to your eye. In this other case, it's a similar trend, but for double bonds. As you increase the conjugation and you start to delocalize and spread that out over many more bond lengths, you see this red shift. So that's one thing to keep in mind is that if you did perchance get an absorption at four or 300 nanometers, that pretty much is telling you you've got aromatic pi star character and that it's probably spread out over more than one bond. Let's move to infrared. Really, optical absorption spectroscopy is not where you're going to go to understand the nuts and bolts of what are the functional groups that are present in a molecule or an analyte. You're going to probably get that with infrared. And just to remind you, in an IR system, you're at much lower wavelengths. So what you're doing is really interrogating transitions between different vibrational states or how the atoms are moving against each other, how those nuclei move. Remember, in uv vis we're dealing with electronic transitions, transitions of electrons among different energy states. In vibrational spectroscopy, we're dealing with vibrations of atoms that also are quantized, so, but they're much, much, much lower in energy, which is why you're operating at much longer wavelengths for both detecting and interrogating your analytes. So this is a pretty typical infrared spectra. And one, one of the neat things about it, besides the fact that, of course, it's inverted because you always report transmittance, is we usually call these troughs. And you can see that each of these features kind of maps onto something about toluene. So if you take toluene and you decompose it into its different functional groups, well, it has a CH that could stretch. Well, it's got a ring that could breathe. Its CHs could also bend. And as you go and you look at the spectrum, you'll see that each of those kinds of what are called normal modes can get assigned. 
Now, you can get really crazy in normal mode assignment. Here's a typical table, and it's actually pretty summarized, of all of the different possible frequencies and how you would assign them. So the game when you have an infrared spectrum then is to look at each of those frequencies and figure out what they must come from in a molecule. The only two that I'm going to want you to know for this class are the OH stretching frequencies, which are up, and they range. As you can see here, if it's an alcohol, the stretch is going to be at the high end, 3,600 wave numbers. If it's more like an acid, you're going to see it maybe as low as 3,000 wave numbers. So by the exact position of that very broad peak, you can learn a little bit about, is it an OH that's bound to an acid functionality, or an OH like an alcohol? Carbonyl is another really good indicator peak whose exact frequency tells you a lot about where it comes from. Unlike OH, which is a very broad peak, carbonyl peaks are very, very narrow. So you can use this table to kind of pinpoint, most likely, what kind of functional group you might have. Now, if you want to really go crazy, you're going to use this whole thing and try to actually identify an unknown molecule just from its infrared spectrum. And I give you a, a website here and some notes if you want to go after it. This is kind of a pretty good strategy, I think, for kind of the order of events. You almost always interpret the OH stretch and the carb uh, carbonyl stretch frequencies first, and then you kind of build the molecule around those. Let's go through two quick examples just so you're used to looking at some IR spectra. So if you look at the spectra, the first thing you'll notice in both the top and the bottom is that you have an OH stretch. And that OH stretch is at the high end. It's about 3,400, which tells you it's an alcohol of some sort. We didn't talk about the peaks near around 3,000 and 2,900. Don't get those confused with an OH stretch. They're narrower. Those are actually the CH stretch region. Almost every organic molecule has a CH stretch. So those aren't really that informative, but just note that they're there. Now, if you go down to the end, you see lots of other peaks. And it, like I said, if this was a molecular uh, organic spectroscopy class, you would be analyzing these in gory detail. But just to keep in mind, these are fingerprint regions. And in an analytical system, you'd probably be taking your spectrum and asking the computer to compare it against a library and trying to see, does it match a known spectrum? Because there are libraries of thousands and thousands and probably millions of molecules. And the computing powers have gotten good enough that you can do pattern recognition. So if you have a pretty pure material, that's a very good way of identifying what your substance is. If you're impure and you're overlaying peaks, then that's a much more difficult analysis. So infrared for qualitative identification requires a fairly pure sample. So what are these? Well, the top one is propanol. And the bottom one is actually just an isomer of propanol. And you can see down in this fingerprint regime near 1,000 a different pattern of peaks. And so that fingerprint regime is exactly what a computer would look at to try to match up the spectrum and actually make an assignment to one molecule or another. What the human brain can do, though, is say, you know, in both of these cases, I'm pretty sure I have some sort of alcohol. Let's do a little bit more known practice. You're going to have to know OH bonds, and you're going to have to know carbonyls. So let's take a look at these two examples. Well, the top one has a broad OH feature, and it's fairly shifted to the red, so that means it's probably part of a carboxylic acid. And it's also got a C double bond O, which is also part of an organic acid. So you're pretty sure this is an organic acid. The bottom one, though, looks different. I want you to tell me what's missing in the bottom one that's present in the top one. You still got your carbonyl peak, but you do not have the OH. And the fingerprint region is a little bit different. Nevertheless, the top is almost certainly a free acid. The bottom is some sort of aldehyde, ketone, or ester because it has a carbonyl functionality. And sure enough, the bottom is an ester and the top is a free acid. So I hope that's given you a sense of how you might tackle. And I've given you some websites you're welcome to go to. They have lots of unknowns. You can try to tear these things apart in a lot more detail. But I just wanted to give you some flavor for what you do when you analyze an infrared peak. Usually, it's by identifying a very particular region that you know the thing of interest absorbs in. And by looking for, is it there or is it not there, you actually know what you have. And that's going to be really important for the breathalyzer case study. Because in the breathalyzer case study, you're analyzing via infrared two parts of the spectrum which are fingerprints both for ethanol as well as some of the other interfering agents you might have in the breath. Thanks so much. I'll see you next time.